So um, the next question the minister asked was, yes, I'm willing to appoint an ophthalmologist, but how long should his appointment be? Five years? Will that be enough? Will he have solved the problem of blindness in the region after five years? Or is the um, number of people blind in the population like to increase over time? So a question to you is what kind of study would need to be done to address this question of change over time? And the answer to this is an incident study. These are extremely challenging studies to undertake because what you have to do first of all is to find a representative sample of people in the community who do not have the condition that you're interested in. So supposing you wanted to know whether glaucoma was going to increase in Bronoland over time, you would need to go out into the community find a representative sample of people at risk of glaucoma, so you'd probably select people over the age of 40, you'd have to examine all that sample and remove the people who already had glaucoma. So you are then left with a sample of people who are at risk of, glau of glaucoma. Then you'd have to wait five years, glaucoma is a chronic disease, it has a, a slow rate of uh, new cases developing in the population. So you may want to go back maybe five years later and find and re-examine all that original sample who you examined at baseline and to determine what proportion of those people who did not have glaucoma five years ago have subsequently developed it. And from that data, you can estimate the incidence of disease, i.e. the rate at which new glaucoma cases are occurring in the population over time. And the value of this data is it allows you to plan long term, which is what the minister was getting at. So the ophthalmologist was appointed. He was pretty busy seeing a lot of patients, doing a lot of surgery. But soon he was becoming rather demanding, uh, wanting more equipment, more sophisticated, expensive equipment, more consumables, a wider range of medication. Some of it wasn't on the essential drug list, um, and uh, more staff because the outpatient department and the operating theatre were really struggling. So the minister was consulted again, and again, the minister asked some very pertinent questions, which were whether any of the eye conditions which um, patients were presenting to in the hospital could have been prevented in the first place to reduce the workload. A very sensible public health question. So what kind of study would you need to address this question? These are a group of studies uh, where the risk factors for disease are investigated. And by that I mean that people are exposed to a risk factor in the past, like smoking or a bad diet or all manner of things, before they developed the onset of the disease of interest. And there are the two main study designs for this are case control studies and cohort studies. Case control studies are simpler conceptually because what you do is in the title. So you recruit cases, so those are people who do have the disease that you're interested in, 
and you recruit controls who are people who do not have the disease that you are interested in but are similar in other ways with respect to age and gender usually and then you find out about the risk factors that they have been previously exposed to were they smokers or not what was their diet like what was their occupation like um, and from that you can anal analyze the data to find out whether people with the disease of interest were more likely to have been exposed to these risk factors than your controls who are the people without. So having said that these studies are conceptually quite straightforward, they are very challenging to conduct well um, and so you will learn more about how to do um, case control studies because as with any research done poorly, the results will be meaningless. Another type of um, study to explore risk factors is more difficult because in cohort studies you identify people who do not have the disease that you're interested in, some of whom are exposed to the risk factor you're interested in and others are not. So let's say you are interested in whether ultraviolet light increases the risk of cataract. You might want to recruit to your cohort study people who've got a largely indoor occupation, so they are not exposed to ultraviolet light, and another group, again similar with respect to age, gender, preferably socioeconomic state status, but these people do have a largely outdoor occupation. You then follow them up over time to see whether the condition that you're interested in, say cataract, occurs more frequently in the exposed group than the unexposed group. So you can imagine these studies are complicated and um, challenging to undertake. Right, so now the ophthalmologist is now really embedded in the hospital, working hard, keeps up to date with the publications and the literature, and um, he realized that, let's say glaucoma, he's reading about the different medications that are available for glaucoma. Um, so he knew that there were various different um, treatment options out there, but he wanted to know which of these treatments would give the best results in this setting. So which would give him the best outcomes for his patients. So what kind of study would you need to address this one? The answer is a randomized clinical trial and this is the gold standard way of assessing either a completely new intervention or to compare a new intervention with what is standard practice or what is the best currently available and I'm sure many of you will have read about um, clinical trials um, and they are the gold standard way of assessing whether a new treatment, be it surgery, be it a new medication, be it a new counselling method, whatever, is the best way of um, uh, improving service delivery. So, moving on now, um, again the ophthalmologist is aware of a distribution mechanism, or the need for a distribution mechanism to deliver medication or treatments to other remote communities for interventions that will prevent disease. And the one that we are very familiar with in eye care is uh, delivery of vitamin A and early treatment at the active infective stage for trachoma also requires mass administration to the population. And here the ophthalmologist was trying to make sure that a high proportion of the population who needed these um, preventive um, medications 
were um, through, could be delivered in more than one way, either through the community health workers who were already in post um, in villages, and he also knew that immunization program staff also visited these same areas, and he wondered which approach would mean that the highest proportion of people with trachoma or the highest proportion of children at risk would receive vitamin A supplementation. So what kind of research is this? Now this kind of research has got lots of different names. Um, it's known as operational research. It's also known as evaluation of complex interventions. And a more recent name is intervention science. So whatever the name, what it means is that you are, you are testing different ways of delivering a known intervention that's known to be work, to work, or you may, may be wanting to, um, no, I think that's probably, we'll leave it there, but it's, the, it's how, what is the best way of delivering an intervention that you know works so that it's effective once you start delivering it into the community. These are complex studies to undertake. They often require mixed methods, so interviewing the health workers, interviewing the immunization staff, finding out what they do, whether they would be willing to take on these extra duties, interviewing the person who runs the health post to find out whether he would be willing for his staff to go out and do these extra duties, interviewing village leaders, community members, would they be willing to accept treatment from um, a immunization staff for vitamin A, for example. So there's a, and then you'd need to have the um, more quantitative or numerical data, which would be measures of how many drugs the community health workers were able to distribute compared to how many drugs the immunization program staff were able to distribute. So there are lots of different elements to these evaluations of complex um, interventions. But I think this is really where eye care is lagging behind and where we need to do a much, much more because we are well aware that there are a lot of interventions that are very effective in eye care. Uh, take cataract surgery. Is there evidence of what is really the best way of reaching those who are unreached in rural populations to increase access to, sur to surgery? We know that eye camps work. These are expensive, they're not sustainable, they don't build the knowledge or capacity of communities. Is there another way that access to cataract surgery can be improved uh, in poor rural populations? And this would fall into this kind of study. Um, so sometimes you can put in an economic evaluation because you may want to say, well, it seems that community health workers are equally as good at distributing vitamin A as the immunization staff, but one is much cheaper than the other. So you would obviously want to go with the one that um, was not so resource heavy. So the ophthalmologist now has become a respected member of the community and he's getting to know people and what is going on. And he has noticed when he is in his place of worship or in the market that she sees a lot of blind people sitting by the road or begging and he wondered why these people were not coming to his eye department. He's now got a very nice setup, well trained staff, they've got good equipment, they're beginning to get a reputation for providing a good quality service. So what kind of research could be undertaken to assess the question that the ophthalmologist is asking.
this is where qualitative and social science research comes in. And qualitative research is all about talking to people and hearing what they say and trying to understand the health problem from the perspective either of the patient or of the service provider. And you end up with lots and lots of text. You don't end up with numbers which you can analyze statistically. So you end up with extremely different but also very, very valuable information because this research can often help to bridge the gap between the science and the, the rigour of that and what is actually happening or not happening or needs to happen um, in a community. So they, there are various um, different methods that can be used. You may have heard of focus group discussions and this is um, when usually it's people who have the same condition agree to talk together as a group and this is facilitated by a researcher who leads the discussion with questions and then depending on what the participants say he may go down a, a line of inquiry that he hadn't imagined before. So it's not proscriptive. The discussion is led by the participant usually. Um, another method is in-depth interviews and this is usually a one-on-one -on -one interview. Um, you may want to do this with a service provider because there are not very many of them. You may want to use this approach if what you're talking about is extremely sensitive and that person wouldn't speak in front of others. Observation, what have the health services got? Have they got all they say they have got? How do patients behave? How do they move through um, the service? Is it all very confusing? And ranking exercises. This can be used to um, get either service providers or the community to or put in order of importance the things that they have been talking about. So qualitative research generates text. So for example, the top quote here may have been spoken by someone who was cataract blind. Let's imagine you've got an old lady living on her own and um, her neighbour went to have cataract surgery and the qualitative interviewer asked her, well, why didn't you go for surgery as well? Your neighbour had a cataract operation in Kanasi. And this old lady said, I'm frightened because my neighbour told me that the eyes are removed during surgery. Now, I wouldn't want surgery if I thought my eyes were being removed. This can be overcome by health education. But without knowing about her fears, you can't give the right um, health education messages. Or another very common um, thing that people say, particularly in rural communities, I do not have anyone to accompany me to hospital. And this can be helped by providing transport or by talking to the community leaders to see if someone in the community would be willing to accompany that person to the hospital. So qualitative research is extremely useful and very important for helping to inform health education, health promotion, and for coming up with strategies which really do address the problems identified by the community themselves, not the problems we think they might have. So um, the ophthalmologist again keeps on asking questions, um, and he had seen on the internet, you can get internet in the capital in Bremerland, that there was a good medication for glaucoma, seemed to be really, really effective. Big advantage was that you only need to use it once a day, and he thought that this would in improve compliance amongst his glaucoma patients because big, big problems with them remembering or ability to instill eye drops twice a day or more. But he knew that this eye drop cost three times as much as pilocarpine, and um, which was what they could afford to buy. So he wondered whether he should start to prescribe these new drops knowing that they were more effective and easier to deliver but being aware that the cost was going to be higher. So he wanted to know whether the benefits of the new drop in reducing intraocular pressure, ideally in slowing the progression of further optic nerve damage, would be worth the extra cost. 
So what kind of research would this entail? And this is where health economics comes in. So to answer this type of question, you usually embed an economic evaluation within a clinical trial. Because the clinical trial will be able to tell you the benefit bit of the evaluation. And the economic bit will be able to tell you about the additional costs. So then you can work out this is the benefit, the extra benefit of these new drops, and this is the extra cost. And then people, service providers, um, governments can make the decision whether it's worth paying that extra cost for the drug given its extra um, effectiveness. And there are several different types of cost um, economic evaluation within health economics, and you'll hear the terms cost effectiveness cost-benefit and cost-utility. They all entail collecting data on the cost, but it's the measure of the comparison at the end of the day which differs a bit. So, um, public health research. The type of, of research that is underdone, is undertaken is entirely driven by the research question being asked. And so, all research should be driven by a very clear research question which is informed by a rationale. So a description of the problem is what I mean by that. So what is the, what is the problem in the community, in the health service that's being delivered that we want to improve? And then what is the very specific research question that we're going to ask to try and provide evidence and information so that that problem can be overcome. It has to be very clearly articulated. It can't be something very vague, like, how can I make healthcare better in Bronoland? This is too vague and you don't know where to start. So research questions need to be very clearly articulated. And you also need to have an aim. So what is the long-term goal of this research? How are the findings of the research that you do actually going to bring about um, any kind of change? And then once you have got a clear research question, it's usually broken down into manageable bits so that you can say, yes, this bit's been done, yes, this bit's been done, and yes, that bit, bit has been done. So that once you've addressed all the objectives, you will then be able to answer your research question and then fulfill your aim. So it, things come in at this way and go this way with an end result that you have relevant research that addresses a relevant and important public health problem with research that's been rigorously, rigorously undertaken. So thank you very much and I hope this um, illustration of Bruno Land will stick in your mind and um, help you to think about the distribution, determinants, prevalence and incidence of diseases in populations and the wide range of research that can be undertaken within public health so as to improve the health of populations.